next speaker is um, um, Fernando Alonso Fernandez from um, Amstad University. Fernando is an um, associate professor in Halmstad, and he was also formerly a Marie Curie fellow and a postdoc fellow in the same university. He is an expert in the uh, pattern recognition, image processing, biometrics, many other topics. And today he's going to give a talk. Uh, and the title is The Human Authentic Authentication Using Facial Cues. Thank you. Fernando. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to the organizer for inviting me to give this talk. It's a pleasure for me. So today I'm going to talk about uh, human identity, biometrics, and not working yet. Human authentication, uh, and I will concentrate on uh, the face, and more specifically on parts of the face. And I hope that after this talk, you get some uh, ideas of why it's interesting to focus on the face, not in the whole face, but on part of the face. So I come from Hamstad University in Sweden, uh, uh, in concrete, uh, the School of Information Technology. So we are a very international uh, dep uh, department with uh, more half of the staff. It's uh, non-Swedish, uh, coming from many different countries. Also, of course, I have to acknowledge uh, a number of people that uh, participates or have participated directly or indirectly in this research on biometrics research, both uh, current and previous staff. And I also have uh, to acknowledge uh, different uh, funding uh, sources that uh, support our research, uh, both from European and uh, Swedish uh, perspective. So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, identity and biometrics and the overall uh, concept here is what uh, we call human aware systems because we are interested in analyzing signals where there are uh, humans present there. So there is the idea of identity of the persons that are uh, involved for appearing in that signals but there is also another concept that we are also interested in which is messaging behavior, because in behavior there is also information about identity. And to do some of our tasks, we need to analyze uh, if there is somebody there. So there is the idea of position, motion. So all these concepts are together uh, interrelated. And of course, they are useful not only for identity, but for many other tasks. So here, uh, there are some examples of the research that we have uh, going on in uh, our lab. So I will going to concentrate in the top left part of the uh, slide, which is uh, the use of uh, face parts for different uh, purposes, uh, including uh, detection and tracking, which is necessary for identity purposes. And I will also show some uh, experiments on expression modeling using uh, face parts. We also have uh, research on uh, micromotion analysis, specifically of uh, the region of the lip or the mouth, uh, for the purposes of identity, because the way that you speak, the way that you move your lips, uh, reveals or can reveal uh, your identity, but can also be possible to try to guess what you are saying by uh, reading your lips not for free speech, but for a small dictionary of numbers or commands or uh, small words or easy words, it can be possible to guess what the person is saying without needing audio information. Also, uh, other related application examples on the bottom left that I'm not going to cover, but uh, which are hand motion, for example, uh, robot identity motion, etc in where we employ uh, similar techniques that the ones that we employ in biometric analysis. And on the bottom right, there is like an overriding idea or overriding set of concepts where we try to concentrate, which is unconstrained sensing, which can mean different things. But in this context, for example, means uh, the use of smartphones where 
you don't control how the person interact, so it's more or less a free interaction. You, there is no operator there, so it's unconstrained in that sense. Autonomous systems, of course, where the, the vehicles move and uh, they move freely, uh, so uh, you have to deal with lots of unconstrained uh, things there. The idea of cross-sensor, I will present some results as well on this topic later on. So, um, this is uh, the outline of what I'm going to talk uh, right now. So, I'm going to present a little bit the idea of biometric recognition. If you are not familiar with on the idea of biometric systems, then I will jump into the concept of phase or phase uh, parts analysis for different purposes. I will motivate why this is interesting, then I will concentrate on different parts of the phase. I will talk about existing research on this area and compare with the iris modality, for example, and I will talk about different concepts like expression modeling, eye detection, cross-spectrum and cross-sensor validation, and finally, sub-biometrics. So many of this, uh, the content of the presentation can be found in two uh, survey articles that we have published in one journal and one uh, book chapter. So if this presentation is made available after the conference, or if not, you can uh, send email to me and I will happily share and you can have uh, all this information available in your computer. So let's start with the idea of uh, identity. So uh, traditionally to uh, validate the identity of somebody. Uh, what we use is something that we have, like a key or a document or a card, or something that we know, like passport, pin code. So these are the two traditional tokens of identity that has been used since, since long time ago. So they are easy, they are cheap, but they are not tied to the person that carries or know this token. So they can be copied, they can be lost, they can be forgotten, or worse, they can be stolen. So anybody which has the token has the same privilege that the person who is the legitimate owner of the car or the legitimate owner of the key or the legitimate owner of the passport. So for example, if you go to a bank ATM, the machine really doesn't know who is inputting the card, basically. You can share the pin with your partner or with your daughter or whatever, and then different people can go to a bank machine and can get the same privilege that you would have with your card just by sharing the pin number. In the case, for example, of multiple ID documents, there is no easy way to check if one person has, for example, different passports unless this is analyzed automatically, for example, by a biometric system. So it's quite difficult if you have like one million of uh, people in a database and you want to know if you have a new passport coming in, okay, is this person having already a passport with a different identity or not? That's very difficult to do if it's not by automatic means. And of course, today there are so many passports or so many accounts that uh, we have and we need a passport for, for all of uh, these accounts so we end up using the same passport for all of them or for many of them or passport related to things that we know. So somebody with little knowledge about us or some kind of social engineering maybe is able to guess the password that we employ for many different services containing sensitive information. So in this, cons in this environment there is one solution. I'm not telling that it's the best solution, but it's one possible solution, which is the use of biometric technology, which is uh, based on recognizing a person based on body information or something related to your body traits, not something that you have, not something that you know, but something that you are. So, it's uh, the idea of measuring biometric characteristics, some biological or behavioral properties, and it's important that they are unique, or these features must be unique, at least in the context that I want to use it, to separate a certain number of people, or they should be somehow permanent or repeatable, or I should be able to model or measure the way that they change in the short or in the long term. So you maybe are familiar with some uh, 
biometric characteristics. There are many in the literature, from traditional fingerprint, face, iris, and you can have many other modern uh, biometrics related to the use of uh, electronic devices like uh, K-stroke, uh, other type of stuff. So, how to choose a biometric? Well, accuracy is uh, often the primary criterion, is what uh, my students in in the courses says, okay, let's get the most um, accurate one, like iris biometric, which is known to be one of the most accurate, but there are other factors to consider as well. For example, if will the person be aware of uh, the use of biometrics, and is it uh, ethical or not to use? That's another thing, but there will be operator involved or not, so it will be an attended or unattended operation. What is the cost? what is the acceptability of implementing a specific biometrics because some of them are associated with criminal, for example. In the past, fingerprints used to be associated with criminals. Today, thanks to the use of fingerprints in the smartphones, it's more accepted than before, but such type of things that uh, maybe makes that one particular biometrics is not uh, recommended to be used for a certain application. The, uh, other attributes, like if, if the person will be cooperative or not. So depending on this uh, thing, uh, maybe it's uh, reasonable to use one or other biometrics or if the person is habituated, non-habituated. So the idea is that there are many different factors that need to be considered and no biometric trait is optimal, but many are admissible depending on the answers to different questions that you so this is the structure of a typical biometric system. So uh, you need to capture the signal with the sensor, you need to pre-process, you need to extract different features which uh, reveal the identity containing the signal and at some point you have to compare the signal that you have captured with some reference templates that you have in your database which previously you have captured uh, following the same ID. So at the end you have some kind of comparison which results in a similarity measurement and you need to make some, type, some kind of decision. There are two possible ways of doing this. One way is that you claim one identity in the system. For example, you say I am Fernando, I want to access here, then I provide my fingerprint, for example. Then the system compares my fingerprint that I provide in that moment against the fingerprint that is store in the database from Fernando, or in this case, the face. So there is a one-to-one -one comparison here, and based on the similarity, there is a decision of accept or reject. So here, there are two types of errors that can be uh, happening. One is that I say that I'm Fernando, and I am Fernando, but the system, for some reason, decides that I'm not sufficiently similar to the template of Fernando in the system. Then it's going to reject me falsely. So there's a false rejection here. But also can happen that an impostor comes here and say, hey, I'm Fernando, but then this person is really not Fernando. But the system makes the comparison against the template of Fernando and says, yeah, you are sufficiently similar, then I'm going to accept you as Fernando. But the person is not Fernando, so he's been falsely accepted. So we have these two types of errors that can happen because it's a binary decision at the end. There is a second uh, possibility, which is that I don't make any claim here. I just give my biometrics, and then the system makes a comparison against the whole database. So in this case, the system has to hopefully retrieve the identity of the person here, presenting the biometrics in the first position. So here it should pop up, the, uh, in theory, the most similar identity to this uh, biometric here. So in this case, what is measured is the probability that the correct identity is returned in the first position and in the first M position. So this, there are two different ways uh, of working and the measurements that we employ to report uh, performance, they are different. So now let's jump into phase. So why phase? Yeah, okay. It's, there are, it has several advantages. And, one of them is that it's uh, the most common human experience, is what we traditionally use to recognize a person on the face. There is wide availability of cameras today, very cheap cameras that you can use to capture face. 
lots of databases, both uh, in governments or an, in public domain, passport databases, driver license databases, citizen databases, and today it's becoming very popular to gather data from YouTube or other uh, social uh, web pages where you can gather millions of images for free of people with uh, known identity and they are very easy to capture in uh, operational settings. You can capture face at the distance. Right now I'm seeing all your faces even if uh, you don't notice and it can be done without cooperation of the person which has advantages and it can have also ethical disadvantages as you can imagine. There are three levels uh, of analysis in the face or this is how I like to present to motivate uh, what I'm going to talk. So there is the whole phase, which I call far level, meaning that you try to concentrate on the whole phase, which might not be visible, it might be occluded, it might be with an even difficult background behind, or the light can be uh, challenging, and these are issues which causes that face recognition systems uh, fail or provide worse performance, but these are unavoidable in many cases, in many applications like forensics, surveillance, mobile devices where you don't have control on how people interact. There are issues that can cause that face uh, recognition systems provide uh, degraded performance. On the other hand, you have the iris texture, which is zooming in into the eye. To get this texture, you need a very good resolution image you need to go close to the human eye. Traditional commercial sensor nowadays requires that the person positions quite close to the sensor, like 20, 30 centimeters, and uh, they usually need infrared acquisition because the eye tissue is more uh, reflective under infrared light. So these constraints make that Irish technologies very uh, difficult to use in unconstrained biometric, in unconstrained conditions where you don't have infrared, the person might not be close to the sensor. So in this context, there is an intermediate level, which is what I'm going to concentrate, which is the, what is called periocular region, which is the region containing not only the iris, but all the different parts around the eye. But it's not the iris itself, which might be of low resolution, and is not the whole face, which might be occluded or not available. So this is how uh, life uh, looks like in many cases. As I mentioned, the iris is very low resolution, so it's not possible to use, and the face might not be uh, available completely either. So in this context, we, and other researchers as well have concentrated in what is called the periocular region, which is the region around the eye containing many different parts and uh, different um, things that are labeled here. So the periocular modality has emerged in recent years as an independent modality with uh, good capabilities to discriminate people, as I will show you uh, in a moment. It can complement face or eye or iris if, if these are available. And they, uh, it's available over a wide range of distances. So for example, here in an iris image, you have also available the preocular region around. And in, face, in a face image, of course, you can concentrate in this part here. It might be the only region available of the face. So this is one of the advantages and you don't need to invest in extra hardware to uh, capture this uh, region of the face. It's more tolerant to expression, as uh, some studies have uh, demonstrated, to face occlusion, because it might be the only region uh, that it's visible. You can have low resolution, so if you don't have enough resolution to get an iris image, still you can use this part of the face. You don't need accurate location. For example, here you have one ex two examples of uh, iris images where the location of the iris fails, but still you are capable of just detecting this region. So all in all, you can 
relax the cooperation that you need from the user to capture uh, so the person doesn't need to be quite close to the sensor to get an iris or if there is face occlusion with some cases is for example if, if it's cold I'm having a scarf or I'm having glasses so then I have to say they take off your glasses take off your scarf things like that which might be not advisable to do so you can relax uh, different aspects of the acquisition so this is uh, a summary of uh, features that has been employed for recognition using uh, periocular biometrics. If you are familiar with feature extraction, then you probably will recognize some of them. So for example, um, the three ones that I've marked in red, which are uh, LBPs, histogram of oriented gradients, and CP key points, these are the most popular ones that was, uh, were proposed in 2009. So these two are the early papers that has been published uh, proposing the use of periocular images for recognition. So as you see, they are relatively uh, recent, just 10 years ago, in comparison with face research, iris research, fingerprint research, which has uh, several decades. We have also contributed to this table with uh, some features that we have proposed and published in the literature. So many studies uh, uh, on periocular research has taken existing phase of iris databases, of course, because this region is uh, available in these databases. So you see here, for example, if you are in phase research or iris research, you maybe recognize the name of some of these databases. So you see here different phase databases, iris databases where the periocular region is available, and uh, recent uh, databases that has been specifically captured, concentrating only on this region here. So you see here some examples. This one is with a digital camera, if I'm right. This is with a smartphone. So there are many different um, type of data. This is the type of a slide that I will tell to any student that don't show in any presentation. There is too much numbers, too much data, but this is the table that we compiled uh, showing all the available databases that was employed in this research. I will, I, I will make zoom in the interesting parts, so then I skip this horrible slide with a lot of numbers. But you can see here, for example, some uh, numbers with uh, facial databases, iris databases, periocular databases. These two columns here represent the errors that we usually employ. So EER is equal error rate is the error when you claim an identity. And I told you before that it can be that you are the right person and you are rejected, or you are an imposter and you are accepted. So this error is summarized in the called EER, and the lower the better. And the rank one is the error when you don't claim any identity. The system returns the most similar identity in the database, so hopefully it's in the first position. So the probability that it's in the first position, we call it rank one. So here, the higher the better. So they are opposite. This is the smaller the better. This is the higher the better. So with face databases, you see that there are very good number. This number is less than one in many cases. This number here is 90 something percent in many cases. Well, face research is an old topic of research. This database has been around for like decades. In many cases, there are plenty of research. So this is maybe one reason of why these numbers are so low. There is one specific database, on the other hand, which is uh, surveillance camera database with very small images and here you see that the number is relatively high in comparison with the others. There's still this uh, decent. So you see that uh, with this modality you can get uh, very good results with, uh, with face databases. With iris databases uh, on the other hand they are a little bit higher but one reason here is because these databases this area is not completely available. So here you can easily concentrate on the periocular region. Here is not completely available. Here, for example, you don't see so many parts of this region. So it's reasonable that with this data, the results are higher. 
with new periocular databases, well, I say that is catching up with some of them. These are, for example, with smartphone database, with the results are still a little uh, behind, but after we published this uh, summary, there were newer databases with the smartphones where results are very good now. So all in all, the idea is that it's a modality with reasonable good results that uh, we expect that it will improve as we keep investing more uh, research efforts here. I will go a little bit uh, quicker now, so I will skip this. We compare this modality with Iris, so here you can see how Iris uh, recognition usually works. So you need to segment this area here, and then in many cases it's unwrapped. But you get the idea that you need very good definition and resolution to be able to segment this region here. So we compared uh, both modalities, periocular and iris. We took uh, some databases here, invisible and infrared. We took different systems here of periocular uh, matching and iris matching. And as we expected, uh, the iris modality is better with infrared. So here you see that with infrared databases, you get a very good uh, results with Iris. Not so good if you go to a, a visible database, which is the opposite here. Here you see, for example, that with visible databases, the periocular uh, modality usually works better. So I will go now a little bit quicker, but you have hopefully the slides available. So we have also tried to estimate uh, expression of the user only using images of the periocular region. So here you have a database uh, which is traditionally used uh, on face expression analysis. So we took a bunch of uh, features to try to estimate which expression is present. So here you have uh, the initial result. This is a, a study that I will present next week in the conference. So the accuracy is around, depends on how you measure, around 70%. If you take this database and uh, read existing studies using the whole phase, they reach like 98, 97%, but they employ the video. This is a video database, and we started using just a single frame. So with just a single frame, we uh, get, uh, well, for some uh, expressions, you see that the results are quite good, like, 89%, 88%, 91 So for high energy expressions, results with just the region around the eye uh, are possible to uh, analyze with uh, decent uh, results. Another aspect that we have also concentrated is on detection of the eye. If you take a standard face detector, they need the whole face to be visible. If the whole face is not visible, they usually fail. So there are works, including us, which has tried to detect the eye directly without detecting the whole face. So this is also an area of research that is uh, active now. So these are some results with a system that we propose for eye detection. I'm not going to explain the details, but the idea is that you get uh, some indication of where the eye center is directly without uh, going to detect the whole face. So we did available uh, a repository for this study. We mark a lot of different images from different databases to be able to analyze if we're doing the eye detection in a proper way. So this uh, repository is available. I will show you also some other examples here of uh, cross-sensor recognition. So this is a study that we did where we took uh, images captured with different sensors to different smartphones. So this is the idea of cross-sensor recognition. And the idea here is that if you look at the performance with the individual uh, sensors, the results are good, let's say. But when you compare images from different sensors, even if they look similar, they look the same color, they are color images, the resolution in the smartphones is good. 
you see that the performance degrades systematically for all the different features that we evaluated. So this is another topic that is a uh, hot topic now, which is cross-sensor, and you imagine that you have different uh, smartphones with different cameras. So just take uh, standard features and try to compare images from these two sensors or from different sensors and the performance degrades. So that's another uh, area of research here. And the last part of my presentation is the idea of uh, soft biometrics. So soft biometrics is um, trying to estimate or try to identify the person by what it's called soft indicators, like gender, ethnicity, age, if there are glasses, mustache, beard, and so on. So this is also a new, or not new, but uh, active topic in biometrics because in unconstrained biometrics, maybe you don't get a good face image, maybe you don't get a good iris image, but still you maybe are able to guess some of these indicators which can help you at least to segment uh, your population and make your life easier. So we took a database of face research, this uh, label face, uh, face in the wild. So this is a widely used uh, database in face research. You maybe recognize some famous people. As I told you, uh, now it's very common to go to YouTube or other uh, social uh, engines and retrieve lots of images or videos from famous people. You don't have uh, privacy or copyright issues because they are uh, public uh, people. They are around for decades, so you can get images of the same person across different uh, periods of time, which is another advantage. And in many different situations, uh, difficult situations with uh, background, light, and so on. So we took two commercial engines that provide this information from face images. These are the results of these two engines with this difficult database. So as you see, the, they are able to estimate these parameters with different performance. For example, age, they do very bad in both cases. And they are good companies, as you imagine. Then we did another experiment. We took these soft biometrics indicators and we tried to get the identity of the person or to discriminate the identity of the person based on these indicators. And we compared also with a hard face biometric system here. So then we look into the performance here and then we combine. So here there are the results with manual soft biometrics. So we mark manually the soft biometrics indicators. This is the performance with just these indicators. So you see that as you increase the number of indicators that you combine, well, you are able to get decent performance, 11, 12%, of course. Some of this may change from one day to the next. So it's one of the disadvantages of using, but at some moments it can help you to discriminate people. This is the performance with uh, commercial face recognizers with this database. It's a difficult database. You see that it's 7.8, 12% uh, equal error rate. But if you complement this with these indicators here, you get even smaller performance. So the idea here is that face and these soft indicators can be complemented. And these soft indicators in some cases can be estimated just from the eye region. So, but commercial systems right now with face uh, analysis, they don't, go, they don't go very good in some situations. So there is room for improvement here, but the idea is that combine they can uh, provide even better results. If you use automatic soft estimation, of course, this estimation, you see that it's not uh, perfect. So these numbers here are worse than these numbers here. But in any case, when you complement automatic soft biometric estimation with face recognition, you still get smaller error than using only face or using only soft biometrics. So this is my last slide. So I hope that I have convinced you that focusing on uh, face parts can be useful and it can be competitive in comparison with face or with iris. And this is of interest in many situations today, in social networks, surveillance cameras, other unconstrained environments. 
if you just concentrate in some parts, you are less sensitive, for example, to expression change, down sample or occlusion of the face, which is prevalent in, in many cases. And, and so it, for uncomparative settings, uh, this is a quite promising uh, field of research. And one, some problems today is what happens when you have very large distance or when you have heterogeneous data, for example, what I've shown you that just comparing images from two different smartphones and the performance degrades. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando. Very nice talk. <coughs> there is a question. Uh, hey, I'll, I'll to, thank you. Um, thank you for this really interesting talk. I have so many questions that I can't ask all of them, um, but just two quick ones. Uh, the ATM identification case with the eyes where the, the face is occluded, um, one concern I have about this is there's, there's good evidence that these systems show racial bias because the training data is often white. So the, the false identification in that case is, uh, is, can be a problematic. Um, that's not a question, sorry. The question, um, I had my credit card stolen about a couple, a couple months ago and I just got a new credit card number and that was fine. Um, if, if my password, if my authentication is tied to my body and someone steals it, I, I know it's, it feels like it can't be stolen, but isn't it just a, a set of numbers in a database? If it's a centralized database that has everybody's face and someone steals it and they can you know, make an Obama style video where they style transfer my face onto a video, like well, I can't, get away from the fact that someone stole. I can't reset my biometric identifier. Is yeah. there any, can you address that in any way? Yeah, it's one of the problems in okay. biometrics. Uh, the, you don't store root raw data in the database. It's not your face picture, for example. It's the features. And you can apply encryption to these features. And you can also change the encryption. So if, if somebody steals your uh, data, you change, for example, the encryption key, then you get a new encryption way. So there are ways to cope with uh, stolen data. Of course, it's one hot topic as well. And, and, or, or put a picture in front of the sensor. That's another, another problem that may happen. And you need to try to detect if there is a human living in front of the camera, which is also a, a problem. Thank you. OK, more questions? Thank you again. Um, the, so uh, I watched a video recently about a school that was using facial recognition for the teachers to get in to like stop um, predators or whoever from getting into the school. Uh, but you could just sort of physically force someone in front of the camera and then you get access to the school. Like everyone's keys are public. Is there a way to use like the emotional recognition that you have to detect if someone's under duress and like stop the machine from authenticating? Yeah, there is also research on, on emotion yeah. detection results, you know, but uh, the, one of the challenges, of course, to, to reliably estimate. You see, for example, uh, results with uh, expression, which is 70%, and of course, it depends also of how you capture the database. But yeah, of course, there are, for example, in, in the EU, they, are, uh, they want to incorporate, the, like we do in the United States, when you travel, you have to register in advance, you have to provide data, and they want to incorporate like kind of interview with an avatar, where the avatar tries to detect if you are trying or somehow to, I don't, so you are a genuine person or you are being forced somehow to try to, uh, put you in, in, in the limit to see if you want to access to Europe rightfully or not. But of course, it's a very active and, and not solved problem to uh, research. Thank you. Thank you, okay. And uh, is there any more questions for the speaker? No? So I think we are ready for the coffee break now. Thank you, Fernando. Also, thank you, the, both the speakers in the, this morning. And thank you for attention. <laughs>